And I said, do you take my... Hey, Destiny friends, this is Paul, and I just want to alert you to this scam I was just involved in at this coffee shop. So I went up to pay for my coffee, and I said, do you take my coffee insurance? And they say, we do not take coffee insurance at all. That's not even a thing. And I thought, that is super unfair, because as a dentist, my patients ask about insurance all the time. Even if we are totally out of network, they ask about insurance. When we were in network, they ask about insurance. So I don't understand these business models outside of the dental world that do not accept insurance. They just make you pay for stuff. So what I want to do with my amazing friend, Dr. Travis Campbell, the superhero of dental insurance, is help you be happier with dental insurance, whether you take 47 PPOs or you're totally out of network. Dr. Travis is flying to Philadelphia with his special insurance cape. He's going to wear it on the plane, and we are going to host a two-day event that will help you with case acceptance, patient communication, reframing your relationship with dental insurance, whatever that means for you. Should you drop all of your plans? No. Should you start taking plans? No. What you should do is make a plan treatment plan your dental practice to see how insurance fits for you without judgment from your colleagues but most definitely look at the nutritional facts inside of your dental insurance plans because one thing i wish i did earlier in my career was really understand how dental insurance works understand how adjustments work understand how i could maximize my happiness i didn't know so whether you were on the road to being totally out of network or you were on the road to taking more plans just find out how insurance can fit for you in a way to maximize your success as a practice owner, as an associate, as a team member, as a dental student. It's one of the most important things happening in our dental space, the changing nature of dental insurance, and it's time for all of us to reframe our relationship with dental insurance. So let's work together, share together, learn together without judgment. Travis is coming to Philadelphia in October, Friday, September 30th, Friday, uh, Friday, September 30th, Saturday, October 1st. So do not miss out on this amazing event in in-person CE to help you learn, figure out how to be successful and have more fun. Text Travis to 215-543-6454 if you would like to be on the pre-sale VIP list. Oh. Okay, this is a dentist who graduated in the 1990s with debt. Oh, it's manageable. A little little tough, but manageable. All right, off 1990s debt. Next, 2000s debt in the purple. Oh, this is my generation. Not easy, but the cost to go to dental school, probably at the high end, $200,000. Okay, off. 2010 debt, green sweatshirt. Oh man, dental school pricing has gotten doubled, even though new grads are making the same. Dentist income is stagnant. Okay, 2020 debt. Everybody on here. Next. Good. 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 Can you get on? <laughs> okay, hold on, Drew. <laughs> There's 2021 debt. It's Paul, Dr. Nacho Goodman. I am here in my office in Pennington, New Jersey. And patient centered care is the most important thing in our dental practice. I'm about to see a patient for a snap in and out over denture trying. One of my favorite things to deliver to patients to help them chew and smile with confidence. The way I describe these snap in and out over dentures is you, we can use implants to snap your teeth into position so you can feel confident chewing and smiling out there in the real world. When you go to your granddaughter's play and you're excited to be there, you can smile with confidence. And then when you go to the play after party and they have chicken parmesan sandwiches, you can eat those chicken parmesan sandwiches 
with confidence. We can make more things fun in our dentisting lives. But you know what's also really important? Patient-centered care first, but this thing is second. And this thing is profit. Because as a dental practice owner, you're the leader of a business. You're the leader of a practice. And you have to make sure you take care of your patients, your team, and yourselves. And these are private businesses. So we need to stay in business to be able to help our patients. And we often do not learn enough about how to be profitable. Patient-centered care first, profit second. We are going to teach you that at our increased patient-centered care and profitability conference. We are going to teach you how to de-annoyify yourself and your team with dental insurance. We are going to teach you how to talk to patients about dental care using patient-friendly terms, not weird dentisting terms. We're gonna teach you how to have the money talk in a confident and caring way. Having the money talk can be super uncomfortable. Training your team to do that with confidence is so important. So you wanna check out the Patient-Centered Care and Profitability Conference with Dental Nachos. It is gonna be fantastic. You can watch it online, you can get the souvenir recordings, you can get extra coaching, you want to pay attention to this. To get the best deal possible on this conference, just text DEAL to 215-543-6454. Welcome to our Increase Patient-Centered Care and Profitability pre-show, pre-event, where you can ask Dr. Travis Campbell and Dr. Paul Goodman. Dr. Travis, you're welcome to start your video whenever you are ready. Dr. Travis Campbell and Dr. Paul Goodman, and hopefully Dr. Todd Fleischman. Hopefully we'll get Todd uh, out there. So Dr. Travis, uh, we are going to have a fun time here. We have all of these people on Zoom. So impressed with my people. We have a celebrity on Zoom. I can violate Zoom HIPAA for him. If I said to you, Dr. Travis, there is a dentist out there who loves dental insurance more than anyone else that you know. He's in the chat with us tonight. Whose name comes to mind? Uh, it must be Marty. The Tasmanian Marty. He, he can prep a crown so fast you can't even see it. That's a joke from Seinfeld. So he's in the chat here tonight. This is for you. We have people coming to our event. I have one of my awesome residents coming back to Philly. Uh, he's already made all of his dinner reservations. If you're coming this week to the Increased Patient-Centered Care and Profitability Conference in person, can't wait to see you. If you're watching with us online and getting recordings, that's awesome. I'm going to drop in the chat ways for you to do that. Um, and save money on that, get a coupon on our recordings. But Dr. Travis, just orient people in case it's the first time they've ever seen Dr. Travis Campbell, author of the textbook that I have here, I carry around with me anywhere, everywhere, Travis, the Understanding Dental Insurance Textbook. We are a sponsor of this textbook. It's gotten rave reviews from many people. Now, Dr. Travis, tell our audience, who are you? What do you do in your dentisting life? So I'm a dentist. I practiced dentistry for 13 years um, and insurance frustrated me like it frustrated most people. But for me, I just sought out an answer, couldn't find much online. So I did a bunch of research, did a lot of trial and error and fixed most of the problems myself. So it's been a whole lot easier working with insurance now that we actually understand it. So our team likes a lot more. You know, we have some day-to-day -day frustrations, but nothing like it was years ago. I am. It's a great point. I, re, I interviewed Dr. Gary DeWood, uh, Executive Vice President of Spirit, the other day. He said a lot of things you've said in that if we make dental insurance a bad thing for our patients, they might feel bad. It's not how we want them to feel. It's for us to reframe it in a way that works for us in our practices, whether you are totally fee-for-service I hope Todd Fleischman joins us later. Totally like PPOs, like you were totally out of network. I mean, it sounds like, Travis, at one point you thought insurance could be toxic waste in your practice, but you found a smarter way to deal with it. So these are some of the props that we have here. Smarties, the teeth breaking candies from our childhood, Travis. So we have a question in the chat. And if any of these questions, Travis, you want to say, you know, see a specialist for a reason about credentialing, you can see this. But this first question, because the point is for us to answer yours is, Thank you for this webinar. You're funnier on this webinar than I thought, Dr. Nacho. He didn't say that part. I just made it up. I bought an existing practice, and I'll answer this too because I'm a transition broker. What are strategies you recommend during the period of insurance credentialing? It will take a few months until I'm fully credentialed. So to set this question up, and this is a real weakness, I think, in our profession slash industry, Dr. Salsa, the seller, sells a practice to Dr. Guac, the buyer. Dr. Guac, the buyer, is not in network with the PPOs. 
takes over the practice and now the patients in network, how do they deal with that? What's some of your suggestions, Travis? Well, I mean, most honest answer is, and this is the one time I'm actually going to say call the insurance company. Let's call the insurance company and ask because they will have a process more than likely. They don't want to be processing you out of network because that means they'll be paying more. Um, so most of them have a process. Some of them will say, you know, file underneath the old doctor. Some of them will say, you know, we'll get you credential pretty quickly. So at least we can get you in the system. I mean, they'll all have a different system. And the challenge is, you know, the, with some aspects of dental insurance, there isn't a, you know, industry-wide answer. They all treat them slightly differently. So call them and ask. And that's a good point. As someone who's been a tra- who is a transition broker and deals with this, this nice anonymous attendee said something that's intuitive but could be dangerous. So I said, if I decide to bill under the seller, the seller agreed to do so until I get credentialed. Would the patient coverage be different since I'm not in network? That is a nuanced question that incorporates potential fraud. You know, so if you you cannot bill under another dentist just because they said it. Um, what Travis get is asking the insurance company. Sometimes they may make exceptions. They may not. Uh, this is really where you really need to ask them. I would not submit any claims. This is just my opinion, my experience. You can agree or disagree, Travis. I would not submit any claims under another dentist who's not me as a general rule. And then mm-hmm. in this transition process, if you can get some type of exception. Have you seen any of these exceptions, Travis? Uh, oh, yeah. Like make sure you get that in some sort of writing and who the person is. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, like I said, the insurance company has no interest in processing you out of network if the intention is to be in network, because um, that would mean they'd pay more. So they actually want to make this as easy as possible as well. So they're going to, you know, try as much as possible, give you an easy route. Now, granted, you know, working with any large corporation, there is no quote unquote easy route to anything. Um, but it, it is the one time that, you know, calling them and asking is not a bad idea. The other thing to think about is, I mean, we throw the term fraud around all the time, but fraud, if you look at its true definition, is in order to make more money from the insurance company. So if you're yeah. filing in order to make less money, you by definition can't be fraud. And that's 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 a a good point, and that's why this. Do you, do you, would you agree with me outside of that the transition process for buying practices needs improvement because this yes. creates a big a big challenge uh, when it should be something where there's a million there's so many things going on for this new buyer already. So really, this is also a time, and since this is not a C webinar, we can totally share with you resources. Um, oh, he's, he's, there he is. Wow. The three amigos right. are on here. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to get Todd in a second, but you can text PPO to 215-543-6454 to connect with our insurance negotiation sponsors. I want to share from, with everyone here. I didn't sprout out from up from a nacho patch, like a cabbage patch kid in 2017, Travis and Todd. I did exist as a dentist prior to that. And prior to that, I met an insurance negotiator, a one-man insurance negotiator band who did this amazing work. We paid him, I believe, something like $5,000. And he got fees from an insurance company for us that were so great that we used until we went out of network. So I used the one-man insurance negotiation band. We also have ones in the Nacho Network as sponsors, if you like, Kevin. But Travis, now I can kind of reveal some of your secrets, right? How... Reframing dental insurance in a more positive way, how did an insurance negotiation company help you with that? <laughs> they increased our fees significantly while we were still in network. I actually, so four years ago, we were out of network with all the three companies. And then we went back in network with pretty much almost all of them. But our fees went up quite a bit. And our collections actually went up by a whole bunch that same year that we switched and profit almost doubled. So, you know, it there are ways to make it either way. My suggestion is with everybody that's saying, you know, don't be in network. I'd agree, don't be directly in network. If you're gonna be in network, be indirectly in network with, you know, third party agreements as opposed to, you know, 40 different in network uh, contracts. And I want to also highlight as people come in and out and just watch a little of that, people can connect with you, Travis, to get 
personal consulting on this, right? If we could use, what is the best website for them to go to to learn more about what you do? I know you have a great subscription service. Share that with the group. Dentalinsuranceguide.com. Awesome. So, so Travis, you are in network with multiple insurances. Mm -hmm. You work in Texas. Explain to us why you have the equivalent of one full-time GP in your practice. So I work two days a week and my associate works two days a week. So we're equivalent of one four-day a week dentist. And just because our dental people, they're very literal, Travis, right? Very literal. They never color outside the lines. One inch outside the line, they freak out. How does that oral surgeon who comes in impact your production? So people just understand. Less than 5%. Right. So that's we why. Because it it's fun. He does some things that our patients can get that I don't want to do. Um, we've had a lot of patients love it just because, you know, they come into somewhere that's comfortable. Um, they're used to. But he's such a small amount of the practice. We love him, but he's just numbers wise, just not a huge. It's added fun, but of your 2.7 million, it's like, you know, it would still be over 2.5 million without him. Oh yeah. He's, if he reaches six figures, it's pretty good year. Awesome. And before I go to Todd, my uh, BFF, Todd, you shared something the other day and we sent someone to an extraction course who loved it. And I have a course, uh, Nacho On Demand C course on extracting teeth. Why do you believe extractions are so fundamentally important for dentists to know, especially the newer dentist? Well, I mean, for one is you got to think about of all the things that we can help somebody with, the thing that is the most dire is something that's putting someone in so much pain that they can't sleep. That's a dying tooth or an infected tooth. Well, Yes, root canals are one option, but not everybody can afford that. Everyone can afford an extraction. So it is the way that we can help the patient in their biggest time of need. Um, Now, I mean, the upside too is from our side is extraction should be quick, easy, and relatively inexpensive. I mean, there's almost no overhead to an extraction. Almost everything we use is reusable sterilizable. Um, so there's almost zero cost, pure profit and extractions, unlike everything else we do that's got supplies and labs and all sorts of other costs. And of course, know what to do and know when to refer, know what to do, know when to refer. Absolutely. But it's also for someone who's had multiple associates, and I'll probably mention a few thousand times, I encourage Todd to hire his first associate. It is the, it is the <laughs> thing that people are really willing to do with your associate because either A, they're in pain or B, they don't want to leave the office. So if you say, hey, I used, I, did, I used to do extractions. We have someone else who does that now. It's an easy way to get a win for your associates. Now I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Todd Fleischman on with us. He's going to meet Travis soon. Dr. Todd Fleischman, we just asked, uh, Travis, kind of just orient the viewers where you're sitting, where your practice is, your total, uh, your so fee for service, people pay a year ahead of time. They run to your practice, they threw dollar bills in and they leave, not hundred dollar bills in and leave. That's what happens, Travis. I've been there. Patients run up to his door, they throw money and they leave. They don't even want the work. That's how fee for service he is. So Todd, tell us a little bit about yourself. We have all these people watching in. First I'm of all, amazed how many people are watching. Hear, in. Can you hear me? We can okay. hear you. Because I can't get my earbuds to work, and that's a complete failure for me. So I, I'm just. <laughs> I know that's not easy. But I appreciate you're on even with your earbuds over, and we can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. No, I'm in my I'm at my kitchen table, which uh, doubles as a ping pong table in my uh, house here in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, Ten minute walk from my house on Rittenhouse Square, and uh, you know, so I'm right downtown in the heart of it. And getting ready for my first day of the week tomorrow because it was the Jewish holiday today. So I got to eke out an extra day off with my family, which was lovely. And tell us, Todd, you have, we built this whole presentation as one out of network dentist me, one PPO dentist Travis, one fee for service Todd. You did a great podcast that you can share with me. It's been listened to hundreds of times. But what would you say one of the best parts for you about being fee for service is? First, I want to say what's up to Travis. Good to see you, man. Yeah, you too. And I'm looking forward to hanging on Friday um, with everybody else, too. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, what was the question again, Polly? What would you say one of the best? I always like to start off with positivity. You know me. I'm always, what's one of the best parts about being fee-for-service? And yeah, awesome. So, so it, it really comes down to this for me. Is my father, back in the day, said, own your own business. 
and I never really understood what he meant by it. But later on, I realized it's because we don't like being told what to do. So um, the best thing about being fee for service is that no one gets to tell me what to do. Yeah, that's and and that and then I like I like that, Todd. Now tell us, even though you're fee for service, and I, I will talk about your history a little bit in the prior, but. How many do patients ask about dental insurance in your practice? Does that word ever come up? All day, every day. Yeah, it's not like we don't. And I tell them, it's not like we don't take it. We're just not a participating provider. But we're happy to do all the work. And I'll talk about all that. We do all the work. We want patients to get value out of their benefits, right? Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't guide my decision making, nor should it, quite honestly, even if you are a participating provider. And you know, I have to tell you that the lecture with Gary DeWood that you did last week was awesome. Thanks. And, you know, all the things he said was exactly right, which is just because you're in network, out of network, it shouldn't change how you're treating patients. Right. And bluntly, if you can get that into your head early on and not be inundated by this dogma that we're taught for some odd reason about what's covered and what isn't or what we think is right and wrong, it's just about um, having the, the right conversations, which, again, is going to be a big part of our topic on Friday. Yeah, words, word, words, man. I, I just want to breaking news. Um, I have someone, uh, another guest here. I have someone, a dentist, waiting for insurance maximums to be increased uh, since the 1980s. Here he is. 1980s is happened. So I'm going to actually throw this over to Travis because I like Travis, and you'll like him a lot too, Todd, because he's not afraid to kindly annoy me. Tell us, dentists get really mad, Travis, that insurance maximums have not increased. But you should say, hey, Dennis, there's nothing to get mad about. And why is that? Because it doesn't affect us at all. It affects the patient. It lowers their benefits. But here's the thing, too. And it's it's interesting because here's one of the biggest lessons I, I learned from business from other people is do not change your practice. Do not change what you're doing. Do not try to change your systems based on something that's an outlier. How many of our patients throughout the year actually end up hitting their maximum. Very few. Across the country, it's four to 5%. Fascinating. So you're not talking about something that's going to make a massive difference. Now, I would actually say in reality, it's probably a lot higher than that. And we dentists are the cause of it, which I'll talk about this weekend. But in reality, for a majority of the cases, the maximum doesn't matter. Now, yes, on the cases it does matter, it sucks. But if you're also talking about and, cases, and honestly, usually when does it really way over matter? Matters. When does it really matter? You know, if we're it's doing just a benefit. comprehensive, anything more than a couple of teeth, which is the joke of it, it doesn't matter anyway, necessarily. Exactly. I mean, yeah. sure, I guess if you're participating and you need to dumb down your fee, opting out or not, something that DeWood talked about, I don't know much about, but like, I get it. It still does affect you. It does. But you know, it affects what, what degree, right? Here's what it affects. I would take a guess, Todd, that you're probably pretty good at this. And most dentists are not is treatment acceptance above a certain dollar amount. You know, most general dentists have a very low treatment acceptance when you go much beyond maximum, which really has nothing to do with maximum. It's more about once you go beyond two or $3,000, general dentists just have a bad time getting people to accept paying that. And it's all communication. Right. All communication. Totally. You, you, I like it. You, you, so that's what one day they're going to sponsor me. I only drink 10 of them a day. It's probably not healthy. The aha moment brought to you by aha is many patients do not go over their maximum. So quit on Rosh Hashanah, Todd, my <laughs> grandma, quit yiking about it because 95% of patients don't. And when that happens with that patient, reframe it in the conversation. We have, and he won't mind if I violate Zoom HIPAA, straight from boost camp of August a couple of years ago, Todd, to be fee for service, it's very difficult unless you ooze big dentist energy like Dr. Todd Fleischman, a shout out from Mike Kleeman from, from Super Dentist Boost August. So um, let's talk about some frustrations of our models. And I was just, so Travis, you have figured out a way to make insurance work for you. We've talked about don't get angry, get even, but what, Everything, you know, Todd and I live in the city. It is awesome for us to be next to world-class restaurants three blocks from our house. That's awesome. It's also aggravating that we just can't let our kids go out anytime we want outside of our house. That's an mm -hmm. aggravation, right? That's a trade-off. When I live in the summer suburbs, I have to go to Applebee's, but I can let my kids in my backyard. Am I trading? Not anytime soon. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. What's one of your frustrations 
of dealing with dental insurance or just even a hurdle that you and your team have to battle? Because I'm asked Todd about some of his hurdles being fee for service. Like what's a hurdle in the daily Travis practice with dealing with insurance? Uh, biggest hurdle is people come in with misplaced expectations. They think it's going to cover a lot more than it does. They think it covers things that it probably should, but it doesn't. Um, hygiene, probably the biggest one of those. Perio is, you know, the conversation we probably have more than any with any patient. Um, but at the end of the day, they're all annoyances. I wouldn't say any of them are frustrations anymore yeah, just yeah. because we've gotten used to them. I mean, it's it's the same conversation every day. I probably have a perio conversation at least once a day um, dealing with why the insurance doesn't cover, you know, four claims a year um, or why it doesn't cover perio at 100%. Um, I don't usually have as many with fillings, crowns, extractions. They all seem to not really care too much about those. It's all the perio. Um, awesome. And I'm going to also just chime in periodically here that you can ask questions in the chat. You can give compliments in the chat too. That's a lot. That's totally allowed as well. Like Mike Kleeman, I violated Zoom HIPAA for you, Mike. So you'll be, you'll be memorial. You'll be in this video forever. Um, I share, you know, and sometimes I've been lucky enough. Todd has these great meetings and sometimes my phrasing has made it to his board. I've seen it up there on the Fridays, but I just say, what's my insurance cover? That's a great question. A lot of patients ask us that dental insurance works a lot like a coupon coupon that has benefits, but also restrictions like blackout dates for airline miles, we're going to do the best job possible to maximize the benefit of your coupon. Those six sentences. I actually have a business coach who's amazing, and she's been in the Oval Office a few times, and she had talked to Clinton once, and she said she practiced her first eight sentences over and over again. So that's so key for your team. And then you can dive into details, but you just reframe it, because I'm going to show a video in a minute just from last week of a patient with insurance who's moved forward. Todd, what's one of the annoyances, the A words, annoyances, aggravations, hassles of being fee for service. It could be people unwilling to test you out. It could be, you know, people saying the word on the street is Todd Fleischman's expensive. It could be any of those things. What's an, what's an annoyance you deal with? Well, I think honestly, it's so funny because uh, Travis and I are exactly on the same page. It's still expectations. It's just the opposite way. <laughs> so the expectations of providing value you know, for what we're supposedly charging, right? And like the joke of it is, you know, in reality, we're really not um, trying to outprice anybody. That's never our intention. And, and nor do I want it to be unaffordable for patients, but it's, it's reframing the conversation of affordability out of the context of insurance driven dentistry, right? And really just not regarding it quite honestly at all once we get past the conversation on the phone, which is why, your team is so crucial. Yeah. Um, so maybe another thing that's hard is finding the team, right? Like having a right. consistent team that allows you to manage a fee for service office. One thing I'm going to be talking about, which is wild, is that I had an entire hygiene turnover within a year. <laughs> Last year, four hygienists. And I have four <laughs> new ones this year. And hygiene is 42% of my practice. And how am I now booked out through the year? And how are we staying consistent? And all the, the, you know, the peacocking things people talk about, but the reality of it is there's something behind that, right? There has to be something behind the ability to turn over what's almost half of my business within a year and still be able to keep the business rolling the way it has. And so that's what I'm going to try and pull out of people this weekend, right? So I'm going to try and share with them is the philosophy of what we do. It's not about the exactness of what we do, although that's mm -hmm. part of it, but a big part of it, more of it is the philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I'll just add a story and she still works with me. If I have time to show her video, because I just interviewed for 10 years, 10 years later, when we started, I went to a treatment plan. My front desk team member it was $9,000 for an 81 year old. And she looked at me from another dental office and said, why are we doing this for her? She's going to be dead soon. Right. And I was like, I totally see where you're coming from. But here we want people to chew until they leave the planet. That was actually not mine. That was my, my we had, I had a great office manager, satellite office, and uh, they, they used to complain about fees. And he said, don't you want to chew until you leave the planet? It was a great, great line. And that same team member now, 10 years later, presents $40,000 treatment plans with confidence because I just gave her the training and the empathy to say, hey, I get where $9,000 from an 81-year-old is coming from, but it's their choice. So I think what you said, Todd, is key. And if you're a hygienist, I mean, they're the front line for your culture, you know, for so many ways, because they have this 
they're the they're the team member that does the both clinical and business part. They just do it. It's infused into them, right? I mean, you know, the front desk is talking about fees. They don't do clinical. The dental assistants are doing this clinical. The hygienists kind of get dragged into both. So it's really, really impressive. Um, anyone who wants to ask a question in the chat, um, we'll do that. Now I'm just gonna go to a quick video. I'd like both of you guys to watch. And you know when like the lecturers like show the pictures of themselves and it's like 20 years ago and they go, you don't look like that anymore, right? You've seen those, right? Travis and Tom, we gotta make sure it's are updated. Well, the other day I was showing a patient video from last week and people goes, oh, Paul, I don't even, didn't know you even saw patients, but I do see patients in my scrubs, in my office. So this patient had not seen a dentist in 20 years, came to us from our direct mailing campaign, which has been great. And because of this conference, Travis and Todd, I took the extra time and I said, can I ask you a favor? I've never done this before. So we all get our afters after we've delivered awesomeness, right? 10 visits down the line, they got the teeth and they talk about it, but this guy just met me. And this was 45 minutes later. And I said, hey, can I ask you about your experience here? And what I wanna share with this video is, this has zero to do with being in network or out of network, fee for service or or PPO, because this patient has a very spoiled guac PPO plan. And he came in through our direct mailer. So let's just check in and listen to a little bit of his feedback. This was from last week. This patient came in and here's what he had to say. Brand new patient, Joseph, amazingly nice person. Joseph, you shared with me you hadn't come to the dentist in 20 years. That's right. Jokingly said you were 65. I was 25 back then. Yeah, right. Now we're 85 and 45. What inspired you to come back to the dentist? Uh, primarily, when the caps fell off the front of my teeth, as you can gotcha. see right there, I felt enough is enough. I've got to get my teeth if I'm going to communicate with people. Yeah. If I'm going to uh, have any relationship with uh, somebody. Uh, you know, it's going to look terrible. Yeah. I can't smile without covering up my mouth. So I think that was a great idea. Come right. back to the dentist and right. see what's happening. Now, how did you choose this office, your new uh, patient here? How did you find out about us? Well, it had to do with the uh, advertisement that I, that I received in the mail. And it's this brochure. And it showed all the uh, doctors there. Cool. And it had good explanation of everything. Uh, your expertise, your uh, approaches, your different, uh, uh, you know, treatments and so on. And I thought this is great. I, I've never seen anything like this. You know, it's a nice colorful brochure. Thanks. It attracted me and uh, it give all the information page after page. And I liked it. So I, it was I, enough for you to learn more, right. enough to get a good sense of learning. So then you right. came in today for this complimentary consultation right. and took a panoramic x-ray. Right. Tell me a little bit about authentically your experience with me in kind of explaining what was going on, the approach, tell me about that. Um, well, your, uh, your approach was good. Thanks. It was very thorough and very uh, hospitable too. I mean, you know, I, I really felt comfortable, so, and I, I enjoyed it. I appreciate and, it. And uh, you, you went over all the details. You were quite honest about everything. Thanks. And that impressed me a lot. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, also seeing the x-ray uh, after a while, explaining everything to yeah. me, the technical points of it, and the good points and bad points, and that sort of sunk in. I, I really like that. And I, really I, I know that. now which way to go. That so that's where I'll stop it there for a second, because that's the part where he says, I know now which way to go. And just for anyone watching, you can ask me any questions about this. I know a lot about Todd's dental life. I know some about uh, Travis's. but. Does it matter so far, Travis, if I took this patient's insurance or not for this consultation? Probably not. Right. Todd, do you see people who come in with tons of problems for your new patient visit? I actually would like you to share. I don't do it the same way as you, but I'm very lucky to have a team of dentists. So I have the time to do the consult without being interrupted and without checking hygiene. Because I know I've learned from Dr. Andrew Halbert, amazing perioprost that once you give people your time on the first visit, they forgive you later. But if you sit with them and you develop that relationship, so nobody bothers me, no matter what's happening. And I, and I spend like patient is all my attention, but Todd, tell us a little bit about your new patient visit. Yeah. I mean, it's a big part of, um, again, showing all my cards early, but it's a big part of 
differentiating the experience uh, right off the bat, besides the phone, right, which of course we'll talk about, which is the first thing, but once they're appointed and once they're in the practice, having that first uh, new patient experience uh, with me and my team is really critical so that they understand um, how it's going to feel different and how value is going to go hopefully further or just hit them differently than they did in the past. And so it typically, it's an hour with me. Uh, you know, we do a little getting to know you early on. I'm good at that. And so I've, I've learned how to um, talk to a patient and get to know them and, and find something that we can connect with quickly. Um, it's a comprehensive evaluation. That's I'm, I'm certain more than 99.5% of experiences patients have had in the past. Um, it's a review of photos and x-rays right in front of them using technology that they may or may not have experienced in the past. Uh, it's followed by a secondary hour with the hygienist uh, using ultrasonic. So I'm going to interject, Todd. I always say I don't interject, I interrupt. I mean, I, I don't interrupt, I interject with good ideas. And it's really something I admire about you. And I know Travis's system is going to be different. But I referred my wife's friend to you and you give that hour of your time to the patient unrelated to their dental needs. Could be small, medium, large dental needs. I don't even know how much, I don't even know what their needs are until I meet Right. Them. So, so, you, so I want the audience to hear that you give an hour of your time. I don't want us to really dive into specific fees right now okay. yeah. for the yeah. thing, but then they go and see the hygienist and they get hygiene, a, a hygiene appointment, x-rays, and they have your exam, really that hour of the time for you based on your normal fee schedule is at no cost to the patient. Is that accurate? Uh, it's about half cost, right? Because uh, ultimately just we, we bring them in on a, on a deal because I want them to get val really true value out of their first yeah. experience. And what's so crazy about it also is that when we bill it to insurance, Oftentimes they get paid more than what that first experience costs them out of pocket. So they actually get an idea of coming to my practice and not feeling like they're not getting value, right? So that's why I want to pause you on is that you, I do my x-ray and consult for free, no cleaning for free. You do this magical time. Now, Travis, if you had this patient, I'm actually curious to learn from you. How do you process the new patient? So a new patient that's a hygiene patient? It's interesting. You could tell me the difference because I do some of this. Not everyone gets this hour with us. When they come through certain channels of marketing, we don't put them through the hygiene program first. And they just sit with me and we do the, the panoramic x-ray and consult. And this patient is now going to be, his next step is a hygiene visit and one extraction, a hygiene visit and one extraction. But let's say you have a patient who says, my front crowns fell off. I haven't seen the dentist in 20 years. I want to see Dr. Campbell's office. How do you guys process that? That's straight through me. And it's very similar. It's an hour. Um, now we book an hour because sometimes it may take that long to talk about comprehensive care. Sometimes it may not take long at all to talk about a quick fix and we just do the quick fix right there. So, you know, if somebody's in pain, they usually leave out of pain. If somebody's got a broken front tooth, then we can do something fast. They, you know, leave with that fixed. Um, so they usually walk away either with a very good idea of what a future plan is, or they walk away with whatever quick fix they're looking for, um, at least to start with. So you see so. Three, three dentists with three different business models bonding together, use a dental term over processing patients with significant challenges. I know Todd does all of his this way, in a way that gives them time, in a way that looks like never loved these like 1980s business terms of like loss leaders, but as a way of bonding the patient with you, like this is, I've done these Travis and Todd and the patient says, thanks, but no thanks. I've done this. And the patient has done it all on six immediate load case with who Dr. Slough, uh, to Todd knows I've done this and they've just gotten a cleaning and nothing else. But I believe that when you process the new patient with care and being genuine, you create raving fans of your practice. And uh, I just think if you have any questions about it, let me know. Let's go to a question here for a second. Is it possible to have an efficient and profitable practice as a mixture of fee-for-service and PPO and give the same level of service? I only say this because patients, customer approach two different things as fee-for-service versus PPO. This is very on point for me, but I'll let I don't know if Todd could even answer because I don't know if he's experienced this maybe as an associate, but Travis, what about that question? Is it possibly efficient with the mixture of PPO and fee-for-service? 
Well, I mean, can you do it? Yes. Um, I would say it's a lot easier to be fully one or fully another because, you know, with having higher fees, for instance, you know, you've got to have the team that can hold on to those higher fees. By the way, Todd, nice. I got two of these. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, it's like a Winnie, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a Winnie mashup. Look at that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, nice. these guys are four months old and they are Aww. super cute and cuddly. But um, when it comes to, you know, the insurance side, it's, Wait, what was the original question? I was sort of saying, I, this is, can you have the mixture hybrid? Yeah. I actually believe you can't, but it took me a while to get to can't. But you're sort of saying it's easier if you're in one lane or the other with your with your model. Yes. When you come here, Travis, and uh, Travis is a night owl, uh, Todd, so you guys can party to the break of uh, 10 p.m. But I talk about Chipotle, which I eat at at least twice a week. I, I talk about Alves as like a fee for service practice. And I talk about Taco Bell and all of those are models that are different. And I do think it's difficult as time got on. I specifically was having struggling with having a hybrid practice. I was struggling with having insurance fees that were 60% of what were listed. I was struggling with hire, hiring new associates. I don't want any angry letters, but spoil guac PPO that may or may not have anything to do with an airplane paying my associates less then up uh, then my brother and I and it, it cost my brother and I hundreds of thousands of dollars over a f- over a three or four year period of us trying to make it work. Um, Todd, I don't know if from your associate world you could talk about this, but do you think it's possible to have a fee for service PPO hybrid in the same place? I worked at one for two and a half years at my second job. Uh, I was a participating provider and my owners were not. And that was great for them because they were really affiliated with Jefferson and like a hospital-based system here in Philadelphia. And so they'd have tons of new patients who all wanted to use their insurance to the most of their value, to the most of their benefit or degree. And then they had their own patients because they've been practicing for 30 years who either didn't have insurance or didn't care about the benefit or had complex, complicated care that realized and these are smart people. They were physicians, they were professionals that it wasn't going to be a catch-all. And so they sort of had a, a, a better of both model. I think the one challenging thing in those models is, is the administrative side of it, right? And so it just, you have to be able to manage that. I don't think they really cared. I think those patients did a lot of their own submissions. Yeah. So I don't think um, it was a hot button for them because it wasn't a super well-run practice. And so it wasn't like real service-driven like mine tries to be. Um, but they definitely had their niche. So I think it's possible. It just comes with its own pros and cons like every other model does, right? I mean, I'll add so- as someone who lived it, it became impractical for me because if you think of the gap, the cement gap, how big of a gap can there be between the crown and the tooth? You want it to be as small as possible. Think of that with our fees. The gap between our listed fees and what insurance was paying was widening every year. And it got to be such a high gap. We did hire an insurance negotiator once, Travis, to close it for a small period of time. But the pandemic reframed my model. But I also want to share, I put 15 years into this profession. I've hired multiple specialists. I've done a lot of things to get to this point, and it's still difficult. So going fee-for-service reactively can be a really dangerous thing to do. Um, Now, let's go back to the insurance world, Travis. And let's use one here. I have this funny thing here. When we did send the letter, I'm not sending the letter. When we did go out of network, it was like a race to tell our patients, right? Because the insurance company kind of sends a letter that sounds like your dentist now hates you, right? I'm not joking. I mean, Todd has a lot. I mean, Todd has a legacy practice. I have a legacy practice. I've been there since I was born in my practice. I see my gym teacher from junior high. So when they got this letter from Spoilguac PPO, they called up upset, not even necessarily at us, Travis, just Mm -hmm. upset because it seemed like they couldn't come to the practice anymore. And we had to do a lot of fire extinguishing. I made an entire video on this. If you guys want to get the video, just text and source this. But Travis, tell us this a little bit about this, with your, whether it's with your clients or yourself, how to deal with this. If you do shift status with the plan, because it'll probably happen to you one day, how would you manage that conversation with the patients? Well, you've got to do it as a plan. I mean, if you're going to drop network and then try to do it, that kind of really sucks because now you give all the credit to the insurance company they're probably going to beat you to the punch 
versus, I mean, here's the upside. The insurance company has no idea what you're going to do, what you're planning for the future. So how about you tell all your patients before it happens, before insurance can react, now you can reframe that story. And then when you drop and they send those dirty letters, patients are already used, like they're already expecting them. They're already expecting how to reframe them. And they're not nearly a big deal. I mean, I, I see it all the time online. I mean, not just like almost weekly. Hey, we dropped insurance and they sent us just this dirty letter to all our patients. You know, what do we do now? And I'm like, well, now it's way too late. You know, now you're making excuses. So you've got to handle it up front yeah. and ideally in person. I mean, the relationship you build with people is not through an email, not through a letter. It's face to face. And that's where the hygiene department comes in. And I mean, I, I, one of my things I do the, don't say this, say this, you know, don't say a tooth failed, say it's ready to retire. Don't call tooth hopeless. I also say informed consent is like a heads up. So I always say to my hygienist, like, Hey, let's give our patients a heads up that we may be shifting status with their plan. So they have a heads up, you know, for some reason, this surprise thing really just throws the human brain off, right? Mm -hmm. We're no one. But I, there's a fun, funniest story. I bought a charts once of like a 76 year old dentist who had a house office from our accountant, nicest man ever. He worked by himself. He answered the phone. His wife used to work with him. She gave up working with him. So I him. he answered the phone, no digital x-rays. We bought the charts. We sent a letter. People were showing up at our office saying, I can't believe Dr. Smith abandoned me. I go, did you see how old he was at the last hygiene visit? Give the guy a break. He's living at the beach now. But patients, especially in dental offices, get really thrown off with change. So I think your advice is awesome, Travis. Get ahead of the change. Be the one who talks to them about that. Um, I have a question here for all of us. And I ask Todd, Todd, in our experience, how much does demographics play into where you can have your practice, fee-for-service, out-of-network, or PPO? Where do you think demographics play a role in your practice, Todd? I think it works everywhere. I mean, I hear, you know, they always see the best practice in the country. Even these magazines, practice of the, of the year. It's in the middle of nowhere, Omaha, Nebraska, know. you know, like somewhere where they have like all the real estate there's no competition. They have these gorgeous fee-for-service practices. They keep it reasonable for patients. They're not trying to kill them. They have a beautiful balance between quantity and quality. Like it can happen anywhere. I think for me, it helps to be in Rittenhouse Square in Center City, Philadelphia, in a community that I'm part of. That's part mm -hmm. of the relationships that I build. A lot of my practice, I mean, I tell anyone who wants to listen that I was thankful COVID hit 10 years into me owning because I had already established quite a bit of a city practice and people weren't coming from the burbs as much anymore. And that saved me. And so it really just depends on where you want to lay groundwork, in my opinion, for fee for service. Part of my early part of my lecture for Friday is pick where you want to live, because once you develop where you want to live, then you can figure out how to lay grass roots and how to like build the whole thing from the bottom up. You know, I had an existing practice, so I'm sort of like I was spoiled. And I'll tell anyone who will listen that that's the case. I don't presume to know how to start anything by hanging a shingle, but I can tell you how to grow 65 percent over a certain period of time doing what we're doing. And so I think there's a lot to be said for that. But I think you can do it anywhere, quite honestly, because it's about an attitude. You, you know? said two things before I go to Travis. I want to point out the one, your humbleness. I want to talk about that in a second. But when you see a practice model that's running well, and then you purchase it and you keep it running well or better, you set yourself up for success. So there's areas across this country where you talk about, Todd, which they're doing, just example, $1.8 million with 50% overhead, but it might be in an area that's off the proverbial beaten path for dentists to live in. But if you take over that practice, you have this awesome opportunity to keep it. You know, I was on a uh, Zoom over the pandemic with this real estate group. And a great group. And there was like 50 dentists there asking, like, Paul, tell me about practice transitions and how to sell a practice. One guy's like, I'm in South Dakota. I make like a million dollars a year. I can't find anyone to buy my practice. You go, how did you get there? They go, that's where I'm from. I go, well, that's the problem. You didn't just pick South Dakota off the map and say, today is the day I am moving to South Dakota. But if you're geographically flexible, there's some really good opportunities. But I also just want to share for a moment for Travis, because it's worth it for this video for the future. What year did you graduate from your residency, Todd? Oh, five. And Todd is really not ordinary because there was a study club in the city where he, JSU, just showed up and it was expensive and he probably didn't have the money. And he was the youngest guy there as a podcast about this, but he didn't care. And he showed up at this study club and he 
held his own, paid the money, hung around with older dentists. And that really was a huge part of you getting this practice, Todd. Why would you encourage a younger dentist, whether it's with dental nachos, whether it's with Spear, to show up more at in-person CE? But maybe I'll also this, why local in-person CE? Well, first of all, you know, it's like a life hack. A lot of these guys have already done the work for you, right? They already have practices. So what are you working so hard for? Like a lot of these things are already going on. These are turnkey operations, give or take, right? And so you know, I bought a practice that was already around when I bought it, uh, 102 years con contiguously, which is crazy. Um, now it's at 120 or something like that. I mean, it's nuts. And so you found this through ABC, always be connecting. So always how'd be you connecting, get, always how'd you get connected with this practice that has been one of the best things ever happened in your life? How did that happen for you? Uh, it was a specialty group that was doing, um, continuing education and my predecessor, was a part of this group and so was I. And the guy who ran the group said, my predecessor, Bob Kravitz, was looking for an associate because he had fallen sick, unfortunately. And Steve Brown, this periodontist in town who ran a great study club for many, many years and was a very much a conduit to relationship building here in town before the internet, before it was easy to find things and do stuff. Um, you know, he had these great relationships. And so I piggybacked off that, which is what you're supposed to do. And so I think that what happens now is that the access to information is so easy that people think that you don't need to develop personal relationships anymore. And I think that's a fallacy, yeah. but I'm old school. So, you know, but develop my, them locally. They yeah. talk about what, well, you know, the, I don't know, I'm going to get the slogans, right. Think local, act globally. Go to in-person see locally. I just did an event in New Jersey with a bunch of 50 to 60 year olds. And there should have been more young dentists there because that's the practices that I result. So whether you love Spear and love Coys and love these things, flying out to Seattle is not going to get you your practice. Spend some of your time and energy going where you want to live. And I did. Travis, tell us about the demographic for PPO versus fee for service. How, do, how big of a factor do they play into your in your mind? I think they're huge. I mean, for every business, you talk about location, location, location. I mean, whether it's online or brick and mortar, it's all about location. I mean, online is, you know, your website, basically, you know, in person is where you're living. I mean, you mentioned it, Todd mentioned it. It is really easy to build a practice rural. There is no competition. People have to come see you or they're going to drive 100 miles to go see somebody else. It's really easy from a competition point of view. Now, it also brings into the idea that I think a lot of dentists are not being true to themselves because I would say one major hallmark of a fee-for-service practice, especially when in a competitive area, is your relationship building skills, your desire to want to talk to patients outside of the office. You know, Todd mentioned he wants to live where his practice is. I've heard so many dentists say they want to live somewhere outside of where their practice is because they don't want to see patients at the grocery store. I'm like, fine, I get it. I completely understand that mentality. But at the same time, that means you're probably telling yourself you're never going to be fee for service because you don't have that relationship building. I don't either. And that's the thing is I don't want to talk to patients about their families, their kids, their cousins, whatever. I want to talk to them about their teeth. And that's it. And I know that. And therefore, I'm going to be true to myself. And that's why I went back in that work um, and made it work because I was getting annoyed by the patients that were, you know, high relationship seekers and, you know, talk my ear off about but things. Tell us, that I, Travis, really I love about. this topic because I want to do freak each other out with their lives like that whole freaking we're old freaky Friday. You switch roles. Like, what does Todd do? I mean, I don't know if you follow him on Instagram. He showed a great case yesterday. I'm always sharing Todd everywhere. And someone legitimately said, and I get it, they said, I never want to do a case like that, right? Todd redid this person's entire mouth, you know, uh, transformed her smile, spent a lot of time with her. From your person, whether it's personality, Travis, whether it's procedures, why do you not like that? Tell the audience, say, I'm a successful practice owner. I bring in over $2 million a year. I have a practice that I like for me and I would not want to do what Todd does. Why is that for you? Well, hey, it's a very, this is very close to me. Um, and he does very high end cosmetics. Um, but I see the patients that he deals with. I've worked with a few of them. They're high needs. Um, and 
you know, if you, you're okay with that and you're happy with that and you want to deal with that, great. I don't. I don't want to deal with all the, the BS. I don't want to deal with the, you know, trying to match, you know, a color that's, you know, a 2.254. I, I want to deal with a two. So it's, you know, it's build the practice that you want to build. And I think that's the important part is if you're not true to yourself, you're always going to be fighting against your model and your systems and everything else. Um, and it, that's what causes, I think, a lot of dentists to fail. And it's the thing that, you know, makes me amused all the time when people are like, oh, insurance is your problem. Go out of network. I'm like, yeah, make sure that's actually going to match you. Because well, you can't take Chipotle food and now turn it into, you know, no. our town, uh, top chef burning food that now, Todd, I'm going to go back to Travis. Why do you like that work? What was the training you did? And why do you, you enjoy it? You take the photos, you like the relationships and like a, like a firefighter of hassles, you run in there and you develop those relationships. So why do you like that, that life? I don't know, man. I mean, listen, I still joke because I'm a general dentist by trade, you know, day in and day out, my bread and butter is still the single unit crown. So I get a kick out of it. I think the difference is a couple of things. One, Travis is 100% correct. And I'm looking forward to this weekend a lot because you got to know thyself. And I talk <laughs> about it in my lecture. If you don't want to talk, if you don't want to build relationships, don't, I don't think you can do fee for service personally, unless you're really on the middle of nowhere and they have no other options, right? So I think there is part of it that is definitely personality driven and I'm driven like that. The other thing is, and what you realize as you get experience is that when you're doing these more complicated cases, you need to work with high-end labs because then you don't hate your life as much. If you try and do complicated casework with low level laboratories, you will loathe high level casework and you won't get good at it. And that's why you need to be fee for service. It all works together. You can't do high level cases and have them be predictable and use high level labs if you can't charge appropriately. And when I put these big cases in, I don't worry anymore now. There isn't as much stress, A, because I know what I'm doing. And that's through training, which you have to do. Oh, I'm, I'm timing out here perfect. So first, and I love this part about you, Todd, and it's true, but you are beyond what a general does does if you go to your Instagram account. But I want you to share with people watching in because there's no shortcuts to doing this. Conservatively, how much have you invested in these skills in your life in the tens of thousands of dollars? To be coist, spear, flying, no, doing- Try a hundred. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I paid for a residency for sure, a high level residency for sure. You've done all the spear course, courses, almost off course. Oh, I have one, I'm graduating from course this year. So to be able to deliver this and deal with the results, it's part of what I'm going to talk about, deliver the dentistry and deal with the results. Now, I want Travis to share why you would not like this. And this would, this would freak you, you out, even though you're a high level dentist. Travis, you did this thing that I thought was a good idea and you wish you did it sooner. And you're like, I should have done this thing sooner. I have more money. I'd have more money. I'd be happier. I should have done this thing sooner. Uh, I've only said it. What is that thing, Travis? Um, they're screws in the bone. <laughs> I think we call them implants. Yes. Learn to place implants, but because you do extractions over, I uh, really, you did great post on nachos. Which course did you take? I'd love to give them a shout out. Which course did you take on that for their implants? AIE. Um, <laughs> they're, based out of Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and I mean, it's, it's hands-on. It's a very low income clinic that, I mean, they work directly with BioHorizons to get the cost to, I think an all on four, there's like four grand total. And, but how many years in the practice did you take this hands-on continuum, continuum? At least 10, right? It's 12 years. 12 years. So Travis- I could have easily done it two years, years out. He invests in hands-on implants and then you go back and you're doing it in your practice, right? You're- mm -hmm placing implants, you're growing your career, you're not doing sinus lifts every day, but you are doing implant work regularly, right? Yeah, I don't do sinus lifts at all yet. Yeah, so you I do- just, I do the simple do implants. Small, medium implants in your practice. Mm -hmm. Now, Todd, why would that freak you out? You ain't doing that tomorrow. There's no chance you're learning how to place implants. How come? Uh, well, I have an associate who's placing them in the practice. <laughs> So, but I even know, if you didn't have like leading a horse to water and making him drink with this, like, yeah. uh, but uh, no, but even if you didn't have the associate yet, even prior to the associate, just whether, cause I just want to kind of drill down pun intended into your fee for service skill set of comprehensive restored dentistry. Phil Faba jumped on before when I was on live and things like that. Why do you say I'm not 
learning this myself. I'm collaborating with outside specialists. Well, again, so for me, it was just part of my relationship outside of the office. So we have relationship-based dentistry, which is really inside your own practice. And then you have relationship-based ownership, which is really a combination of your team and your patients, but then also sort of what is outside of that scope, right? So your relationships with your specialists is really the biggest one outside of that immediate inner circle. And for me, just knowing the way I was going to practice, I wanted to make sure that I had really strong relationships with some of the best specialists in center city, Philadelphia. And in doing so, um, that really instills a little, like a mini community. And, and that's the kind of thing where we start to collaborate and get really comprehensive sort of extraordinary results because unfortunately a lot of the surgical stuff that's coming out of my practice is not basic, right? Or should right. be done out of a generalist office. And so I need the skill set of an upper level surgeon to manage. Now, I have Dr. Caro who's replacing basic, like, like Travis, simple implants because I do think, and I agree, that if I was going back now, you should know how to put an implant in from start to finish, you know, do an implant restoration from start to finish, you know, all three parts, surgical, abutment, crown, custom, whatever, blah, 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 uh, this day and age. So I'm a little bit behind the eight ball, but ultimately I think it worked to my advantage for my model just because of how I practice. Yeah. So this is just me sharing that we're learning from everyone here and that what Travis does, Todd, is not up for him. What Todd does with high level relationships, I'm kind of in the middle of this. We're going to do a few more questions. Since Travis is an hour behind, I can keep him extra. And Todd and I don't sleep anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I want to keep a few more questions. If you would like to get the souvenir recordings of what we're doing this weekend for the best deal possible, text recording to 215-798-9897. It's going to give you the opportunity to have this have this information to learn, relearn, onboard new team members, and listen to us at any time. Now, Travis, this is for you. I have two good questions, one for Travis, one for Don. How do you build a $2 million practice accepting most insurances, or is it all bread and butter? What, what skills would benefit new graduates the most if they wanted to be like you, Travis? Communication skills by far. I mean, it does not matter what dentistry you do if you can't get a patient to buy it and buy it from you. So that's the number one. I mean, I have learned a whole bunch of things I don't do anymore. You know, I, you know, Todd said it was in the hundreds of thousands. I would easily say by now it's in the seven figures on how much money I've spent on CE and training and new equipment and everything else. And I'd say half of that I don't even use anymore. You know, we did CAD CAM and we gave it up. We did TMJ therapy and we gave it up. And that alone was like 400 grand. So it's, but it's things that didn't work for me. It's things that just weren't for me. And I was, I, I, I think some of it is I got into this mentality that is very dangerous online of it works for somebody else. Therefore it must work for me and not listening to that little internal, you know, thing that's saying, no, you probably shouldn't do this. This doesn't, you don't like the process. It doesn't sound like it's going to match you. Um, and I should listen. So, I mean, I've, I've probably wasted more money than most dentists on lots of things in the training side. But in general, but, I want to share with both you guys, and I want to share on this line online here is I do like four things well, but public speaking is one of them. I've taken a ton of training on it. Okay. Ton of training and how to speak by Patrick Winston is 12 million YouTube views. It's phenomenal. You, everyone should watch the target patient, but building a fence around your idea, knowing what your idea is and knowing what your idea is not is key. And really those courses just made you define what your idea is, right? And your idea for your practice, yes. it wasn't a waste. It was just defining what your idea is. I'm just gonna show this video, not to compliment myself, but this is Ryan Robinson, Dr. Ryan Robinson. In 2014, he went to a course with me, well before nachos. I talked about the nine words, the millions of dollars. He went back to his practice and his team said, what are you doing? All these patients are saying yes to implants. And he looked at them and said, I just say, what Paul told me to say. And I can tell you, I took that to my practice on Monday morning and I was, I was, I was rocking case acceptance. My case acceptance went from 50% to 90% just by using those magical words that Paul Goodman shared with me. So I owe a lot of my implant um, successes to Paul. Um, obviously he's a, he's a very talented um, 
a very talented entrepreneur, <laughs> and he gives us kind of the, the uh, tools that we need to talk to our patients a little bit differently because dental school arms us with a lot of information that doesn't necessarily translate into success. So what's interesting is PPO, PPO Travis says about communication, out of network Paul says about communication, and Todd, for a new dentist early in their career, do you sometimes see them overvaluing clinical techniques before they have the communication skills to deliver those techniques? I just wish people would just calm down, quite honestly. I mean, listen, there are some rock stars out there that we knew in dental school who were doing bridges before they left, you know, roundhouses and all sorts of crazy stuff. God bless, that's an outlier. But most people come out and need to practice work mm -hmm. for somebody else, work for Medicaid, work for HMOs, work for big box stores. And they need to understand that it's a combination. You're practicing a couple of things. You're practicing your clinical skills. Certainly you have to get your hands underneath you and learn how to use a mirror. Cause I mean, you can't practice like this for your whole life. So you have to learn how to use a mirror and that takes time and you have to actually practice. And second of all, you have to learn how to speak to people. We, I, we all know I mean, I know the most successful, traditionally the most successful general dentist in town here in Philadelphia until the past couple of years ago was someone who had good clinical skills, but was better at talking to people and yeah. ran the most incredible fee-for-service practice without the tr training that I've gotten, right? So, so words matter. And so yeah. cer certainly I think it's really a combination. A new dentist really has to learn how to finesse how to speak to patients, how to speak to their attendings and mentors and how to, what they need to learn and how to ask questions. But then also, of course, do the dentist. do both. Learn clinical skills and communication skills. Which is why our job, time. and I, listen, I tell patients this and I'll leave with this because then I'm going to go finish Better Call Saul. Sure. But um, I, uh, uh, I tell anyone who wants to listen that our patients, especially I tell, this job is ridiculously difficult, right? Like, we don't have to only do clinical skills with our hands on a micro level, wearing microscopes on our face with lights attached to them, okay, to be able to see things on a, on a, on a high-end level. But then we have to not only sell it to patients, so to be in sales, run a business, understand how to collect yeah. money and speak to patients about it emotionally, physically, psychologically. You're not, most people aren't cut out to do it at a high level, which is why general dentists are caught in these averages of salaries that are less than $200,000 because they can't figure it out. They don't, they're, they're trying to do too much. My attitude is consolidate a little bit, right? Use your energy and put yeah. it in a, a more laser focused way. And I have a feeling it's going to lead to better success. I love that. They're focus, focus on that. I'm let you go. But Mike asked one thing, how difficult was it to bring in an associate or associates now, how did you manage it when people were there just to see the Todd? Yeah, well, it's very challenging. We're going to talk about it. It still remains challenging. But just like it was when I came on, and no one thought anyone could ever replace Bob Kravitz. Literally, people thought that the practice was going to die. And I was like, I can't imagine that's going to be the case. And so just, oh, like, that. That, just, like, just like that, um, it takes time. And there are going to be zealots who will not see anybody else. And those are the ones that you have the strongest relationships with. And you can say to them, and I have these conversations now where like, if you want to keep your mouth healthy and allow me to also live my life at the same time, you have to be willing to let someone else see you. It can't, right. you have to be willing to go in for hygiene when I'm not there. I mean, I have patients who won't even go for hygiene when I'm not there. And, and that's and, why. And, and Todd, I think we just, what Travis shared with the 5%, and I've had to deal with this sometimes on my own terms and sometimes not on my own terms of my dad's sudden death, we had to deal with this. And I like to be humorous. And I just say, Mrs. Smith, who am I to, to deprive earth of just one dentist seeing your mouth? I want to share the joy of your teeth with someone else. They smile. And then I look at them in total seriousness and say, Mr. Travis, Travis, Dr. Alicia is someone from a GPR. I trust her to do this filling on me. It's very key. You have to put the procedure that you try not. I trust them to retreat the second endo, second molar endo me. I trust them to do this crown of number 20 on me. And after the procedure, I would love your feedback. If you have any challenges, here's my personal cell. Now they feel special. You put your, that yourself into the circle of trust and you must do that for your associates. I'd also just like to say, you know, part of it is I didn't have an associate until I was 10 years in. Yeah. Right. And so I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that I built trust equity with these patients, right? Mm -hmm. They knew just like when I came on, 
that if Kravitz hired me, I must be all right. Well, that yeah. holds up on my end of the bargain too. Now, what I have to do now is make sure that I bring in an associate who is better than all right. And that's challenging. Anytime you onboard anybody is going to be yeah. challenging. But and also patients, patients sometimes have just ridiculously unfair expectations of another provider and you have to recenter them, right? You know, it's, it, 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 and having those difficult conversations gets you more time off, gets you less stress. Arguably the money part, I'm not so sure, but if you want to live a life like that, you have to be willing to have those challenging conversations. Uh, I'll finish up with Travis Todd for a few more minutes, but cannot wait for this weekend. Uh, so thanks so much for being on here with us. If people want to just follow you on Instagram, what's the best way for them to do it? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm at Center City Philly Dentist. I'm easy to find. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Honestly, I'm working hard on this lecture, guys. I, I really feel like it's got a lot to offer. And I, I think it's going to hopefully change some people's minds. I, you know, we have an opportunity. You know, you continue to build this community, Paul, yes. that I feel strongly about. But we have an opportunity to shift mindsets. It starts slowly. but I mean, anything's feasible. I just yeah. think that we have to be open-minded and I think this weekend's going to help. We can't wait to see what you, you deliver to us, Todd. Really appreciate you being I'll on I'll see here you this us. weekend, Travis. I can't wait for this weekend. Thanks. <laughs> Tom. All right, guys. Thank you. As Travis and I finish up, uh, A, if you'd like to get the nine words of the millions of dollars that I've taught this dentist, just text words to this uh, this number, 215-798-9897. Comes back with a video sharing how to do it. The one last thing I want to touch base on, Travis, was just um, the value of membership clubs in your practice. Uh, how do you utilize them? Because I believe membership clubs are something that cuts across PPO, out of network, fee for service. One of my regrets, Travis, is not doing one sooner. I totally mm -hmm. missed the boat. Missed the boat. Bob D's on here. So we'll talk a little extra for Bob. He's on here. So he's, he's out. But membership clubs, we'll stay on for Bob for a little bit more. Bob, you can ask some questions too. I am sharing as a 45 year old dentist who's bought multiple practices, dealt with multiple dentists, had great years, challenging years. I got letters saying dental insurance is going to pay me less. And I didn't have a Travis Campbell back then. I didn't have a PPO negotiator. I just cried inside, right? I just literally, I got a letter, Travis, that said, we're going to pay the Goodman brothers $100,000 next less next year, deal with it. And we had no idea how to change that, right? Mm -hmm. Membership clubs, I really regret not paying attention to them sooner. I saw them advertised. Tell us how membership clubs play a role in your practice. I mean, because we're fully in network, they play a small role, but they still play a role. I mean, we've got cash patients who um, it's hard for them to see spending full fee. I mean, it just, it is. And we, have below average fees for our area just because you know if anybody's ever going to complain about a fee i want to send them online to look it up and go oh yeah we're actually lower um but membership fees just the reason insurance works the reason insurance drives patients to seek treatment is it's a benefit that they have that they now want to utilize well membership plans the same thing is now they have a benefit that doesn't come with all the restrictions that insurance comes with and a lot of times can be less expensive and without all the blackout dates, as you say. Yeah. So it, but it's a plan. It makes them want to use it more. Um, you know, it, there is a statistic out there that patients accept like 40% more treatment, spend 40% more money when they have a plan versus no plan. Um, and it's crazy. I mean, and we're talking even not like in network things, not with discounts, just with they just spend more money because they feel the value. And that's, yeah, I mean, the, the I mean thing. maybe we could just pay attention. I don't know if anyone's heard of these companies, uh, Amazon Prime, Costco, <laughs> multiple yep. streaming channels. And, you know, this is my, my, these are Nacho sponsors. I happen to use dental stores who I like, but there's numerous sponsors. If you text club to 215-798-9897, you will be able to find out how membership clubs can help you. But even the membership club Founders, Travis, say DIY it if you're too cheap to hire someone because it's better to have it than not have it. Why would you not DIY it? Here's why, Travis. I just want to ask you a question why you would not DIY it. Have you made a record base in your office lately? Have you made one in, on, in, at night? Do you make oh, record no. Do you make Absolutely. custom trays? Okay. No. So I have zero judgment, but people who don't want to DIY things, they can ask. I don't even, Paul, I don't even reset teeth. If I yeah. don't like my teeth on a wax up denture, I knock them off, take a brand new black, 
wax and then send it to lab and say, you deal with this shit. I'm not, I'm not messing with that. No, yeah. it just takes too much time. My time is more valuable spent elsewhere. So when people say you could DIY with a spreadsheet, sure. I, I just encouraging you to really look into the magic of membership clubs, use the right rules, check them with all the regulations, but it's been an awesome one. Awesome one for me. Now um, let's see. There's um, the name of the YouTube channel is how to speak by Patrick Winston. And we'll just do a few lightning ones, uh, Travis and, Let's go with just fundamental. I'm going to talk four about minutes, this. Paul. Four minutes, perfect. Four minutes. Uh, claim processing errors. What are the most common things that dentists are doing for claim processing errors? Um, you mean that are causing them? Lack of causing documentation. Them, yeah. Whether it's lack of documentation? It, purely lack of documentation. You know, thinking that a x-ray of an amalgam that looks perfect and sending off for a crown somehow is going to get you paid for a crown. Um, it, and again, it, it's this interesting mentality that we're doctors. Okay, great. That people should listen to us just because we're doctors. I'm like, okay, that's fine until you're asking for money. And now you've got to give a little bit of proof on why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and especially when it's somebody who's never been in the office, think about it this way. You know, the probably the most difficult person that we ever deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is the spouse of yeah. a patient who wants a lot of work and refuses to come to the office to learn about it. Like, well, how do you teach them right. the value of what you're about to do on their spouse so that they will agree to spend the money? Well, here's the thing. They love their spouse. Insurance companies don't give a damn about their patients. So now you got to convince somebody who has no relationship with this patient to spend the money. Right. And that's the thing is it's, it's one step further than what we deal with all, you know, every day, which is the spouse that hasn't come in. So we've got to give that documentation to show what we did and why we did it. That's yeah, I, I like that. Well, I, speaking of spouse annoyances, I want any spouse annoyances. We'll let you jump off, Travis. You're going to see you this weekend. People can get the recordings. Anyone who's hanging in here, I'm going to stay for a few more minutes and share a few things. But Travis, what's that website where people can get uh, get your dental insurance training and subscription? What's the best one for them to go to? Dentalinsuranceguide.com. I make Dental it super difficult. Well, thanks for sharing all this value, Travis. Really appreciate it. Good to see you, Paul. See you this weekend. Tavis will be in town in Philly. Can't wait to see him. Uh, the send I send all major procedures uh, for pre-estimates. Travis is not a fan of pre-estimates. We still here. You can jump off, Travis, but he does not like pre-estimates. We still do do them. We don't. Let I'll tell them you why this weekend, but no, they are awesome. This weekend, Travis is going to. I like cliffhanger. It's like a it's like a modern day streaming show. Travis is going to tell you why he does not like pre os this weekend. Um, I'm going to show you guys a few bonus videos here. I also give you guys some bonus. Uh, content. If you would like a extraction course on surgical extractions, not on demand, just text sweat to 215-798-9897. As I kind of get Nacho Studio uh, put together here, I'm going to show some share some videos. If you want to put any more questions in the chat, please let me know. So thrilled you guys hung in with us. Hope you guys join us this weekend online or in person. If you would like to get the recordings for this weekend at the best price possible. Just do this. If you want a recording of this show, text DUNK to 215-798-9897 to get the recordings of this weekend. Text recording to 215-798-9897. Thanks so much for hanging in here. I'm going to play a few videos for you while I get the studio cleaned up. If you have any questions, let me know. And thanks so much for listening in. Who hadn't seen the dentist in 20 years. He came in to visit us today. How did he get here for his complimentary panoramic x-ray and consultation? Through a direct mail campaign. So when I start off my visits, I don't put on my loops. I don't put on my mask. I sit across from the patient and chat with them for a few minutes. And this is how I start off every time. Hi, my name is Dr. Paul, sentence one. I am so glad that you are here, sentence two. I know the dentist is not everyone's favorite place, so you should be proud of yourself for coming, sentence three. I have one question for you, sentence four. 
What can I do to make you happier? Sentence five. Those five sentences are magical. We're taught in dental school to say, what's your chief complaint? Which is like, what's the worst thing going on right now? Not good energy in a place people don't wanna be at anyway. So I reframe that. I say, what can I do to make you happier? But that question's important because the patient will say something. And this patient lifted up his lips and said, these crowns have come off a few years ago. I'm embarrassed to smile and I want to get a better smile. So I also share with the patient that we're gonna take a mouth tour inside their mouth and review the x-ray. So after doing that, reviewing the medical history, getting to know them, I do the brief mouth tour. And then I review what's happening on the x-ray. And I share with the patient, if you could just do one thing to be healthier, it would be on the lower right where you have, I explain over here, healthy, 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 healthy problem. This black area over here represents a group, a, a, represents bone infection, represents mush. And then I share, just like our office, if a fire started in that little trash can over there and nobody paid attention to it, the whole house could be on fire. So when you have an infection like this, and I'm so glad you don't have pain now, and I'm so glad you don't have outside or inside, outside the face or inside the mouth swelling, but things like that can cause major problems. So if left untreated, now I say, even if you decide to do nothing, we can still be friends. Even if you decide to do nothing, we can still be friends. But it's my job to tell you what happens if you do nothing. And if left with doing nothing, that tooth can cause a major problem, including major infections. Then we go over the structural problems with the wisdom teeth. We talk about the front teeth, where the teeth underneath, I like to use technical terms, like the teeth underneath. I use, I use a glove on my hand. I say if my hand disintegrated, turned to mush, those teeth have been mushified. That's why the crowns have come off. We will find out if it's possible to maintain those teeth that they may need to be replaced. Our direct mail campaign showcases the implants that we do the patient was very impressed by how thorough the direct mail campaign brochure was, or this magazine was, the technology that we had, how we did many things in one place. That was something that was impressive to him. But then when you have this overwhelming treatment plan, extractions, removal of an infected tooth, two laterals that have been mushified, I would say, let's start doing a few good things right. So we talk, start with comprehensive care, a hygiene visit, the small x-rays that we need, and removal of that number 31. Rolling along for this super fun show, Toppings, Business Leadership Toppings, A Story of Help. We're going to bring up one of my favorite people in the dental world uh, next, not just because he compliments me on the food I select for CE courses, but what we're going to do is talk about one of my favorite things. So everything that matters needs a system and everything matters is my favorite quote and make the best decision in the moment. So we just had Nick talking about dental insurance because offices use dental insurance like my office. Good example, me, guy in blue sweater. But also, I use an in-house membership club for people that might not have dental insurance, may have lost their dental insurance during the pandemic. So I want to welcome Tom Camarota, who have been on Nacho TV many times. But Tom, if you could share a story of help, that would be awesome. And dig into, then we'll dig into what you guys do. Yeah, I think you're still muted there, Tom. Oh, unmute myself. I thought I was waiting yeah, yeah. for you to unmute me. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so what we do is we help dentists start up uh, their own membership savings plan, and we also help them sell products to their patients, so we do a, a number of things. But uh, one of the most in interesting uh, things that uh, I've heard in the, in the last couple months is when a dentist told me that they had just recently gotten a letter, and this was in the summer uh, of COVID, basically, uh, and they had just gotten a letter from uh, their insurance company saying, hey, you know, we're going to decrease our reimbursement.